Um, Shabbat Shalom, and we're continuing for our Rastafari sabbatical study, number 38, and we're on Korach, or Kore, or Kore, and we're touching on the names, right, on the names and the importance of studying biblical names, and it was mentioned, we left off on speaking to um, our advice and instruction to the disciples and those who really want to understand the Bible to get into the Hebrew, to get into the study of the various different names associated. I mean, even without gaining a, a fluency within Hebrew, you'll still be able to begin to anchor your knowledge as well as your ability to interpret it in its proper context. The names are really the keys. The names in the scriptures are the keys, and we were touching on um, Kora or Kore, and we were saying that there's also a name with K O R E, K O R E, um, in the in the scripture, and in that form, the name means caller. It means caller, a crier, a proclaimer, a beseecher, a convoker, a reciter, a partridge, like a partridge in a pear tree, a partridge, a quail. Any calling bird, and this is interesting because here's where the Ethiopic connection, you understand, kind of comes in. The Kura, you understand, you have the Kura, you know, um, you have the, the, the so-called raven, if I'm correct, the raven, and there's an there's a Ethiopic bird also with a very similar, a similar name to this. So in the Hebrew, right here in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, we have K-O-R-E, and he also was a Levite. He was a descendant of Korah. How interesting. He's a descendant of Korah, and his name is spelled, let's spell this right here. His name is spelled um, in the K-O-R-E sense. So now this is the Ethiopic, but there's another Korah, you understand, who descends from Korah the rebel, one of those who rebelled against the authority of Moshe, and they intruded into the priestical office. They intruded into the priestical office. It's almost as though one says, yes, I and I is a Rastafari priest, yet don't know any Amharic, or have not begun the study of Amharic. In a sense, you are intruding into that office, but you are not called or prepared for that, that can be your aspiration, but one must be, one must study and show themselves approved. In other words, so they went into that particular office here, getting like, well, aren't we Israelites too? Is it only Moses, so forth and so on? And we won't go into the details of that, but we want to mention this other Kore with a K O R E. You understand that's in the Bible as well. Also being a Levite, also being descendant of Korah. As well, but let's first go to um, Korah with the K, and in your Bibles it'll be K O R A H. The C H is more the Hebraic for the Korah, the the Bach, the <laughs> that particular sound. The same sound in the Nagusu Ha of Hila, which is said now in Amharic as Hila, but has lost. It's been effeminized, but in its original sense, when we say his Majesty's name it would be Haila Shilase, not just Haila Shilase. That's how modern Amharic speakers speak. But just to point out some of these particular sounds and the nuances that also exist, because word, sound, and power is very important. Now, Kora with the K O R A H, according to his Hebrew, the name means bald. Once again, the bald idea, smooth, crystal, clear, ice, cold, bald-headed, without horns. Now, this is interesting, without horns. Now, what does that mean right there, without horns? Because you, there are some representations of Moshe or Muse, and you might have seen this in other videos or even in research, where they, I think Michelangelo did a, uh, a Moses as well, and he had these horns. And they take that from a particular interpretation of the scripture, where it seems to um, indicate that Moses had horns. So there were horns that was um, projecting from from Moses as well. But Korah here, who um, 
who denies and defies the authority of Moses and Haaron, his name says without horns. You understand? Without horns. And this further verifies what we said about using Shams, uh, Samson as an example, in, in other words. You know, using Samson being on, on a, there is a solar type of um, ancient primitive mythological understanding within these particular names. That's why much in the scriptures um, can also be seen in ancient cultures. The, the principles of ancient mythology are very, very important. However, in the modern Western world, a lot of these things have been um, kind of dumbed down and trifalized. And therefore, there's the great confusion about, well, what did the ancestors really see? They saw actually everything. It's just the fact that we now, in this, in this modern um, Gentile misunderstanding, have to study and show ourselves approved so we can put it into its proper context. And this whole thing becomes very much more clear, clear to us and, and over, overstandable and overcomable. Now, Korah was a son of Esau. There's a Korah who was a son of Esau, according to Genesis chapter 36, verses 14 and, and 16. There's a Korah, son of Esau. Uh, B, secondarily, there's a son of Izhar. Of Izhar, descended from Levi through Kohath. Now, Kohath, you recall, there's the Kohathites, and they're a particular order of priests. We touched on them, I think, about two, three Sabbaths ago, but then the book of Numbers, it speaks about the Kohathites, the Kohathites and what were their particular responsibility under the Levitical order. Now, this Korah, this particular Korah, was, was one of those who rebelled or denied the authority of Moshe, of Musa, the head of the fraternal order of the Levites, and Aaron, and Aaron, and he was destroyed. He perished by the earth's opening beneath him and swallowing him up in Numbers chapter 16. Now, what's very interesting, those who have studied and have, you know, have studied ancient Egypt, is that this now begins to paint a picture of what's known as the Duat or the Tuat, the Duat or the underworld the Egypt of the underworld. Some might call it the Amenta, so forth and so on, the West. But it's interesting in, in many different ways because the context of the people who came out from Egypt, they understood these things, just like we understand certain things in this society that if we write or talk about it, we're not going to go into much detail because everyone else that we're writing or talking to, they understand in the same context, but people thousands of years later on, who live in another type of culture, being other kind of people, might and would misunderstand or misconstrue unless they were either initiated in it or unless they were, you know, un unless they were um, instructed or guided. So it's interesting, the whole earth opening up, and we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail at another time. I think Macy also touches on that and kind of bring together certain ancient elements for those of us who want to study and find more of the truth for ourselves. But in this portion of the Torah, this is what happens. That Korah is one of those who rebelled against Moses and Aaron, against the authority of Moses and Aaron as, as Jah or as God, the true God's chosen spokesmen, spokespersons, representatives, and they were destroyed by the earth literally opening them up and swallowing them up alive in, in, in Numbers chapter 16. Now, metaphysically, metaphysically, it means coldness and unproductiveness. So Korah, this portion here, the rebel, one of the rebel leaders, his name metaphysically means coldness and unproductiveness of life and good. So it's a coldness of life. It's an unproductiveness of life. And, 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 and it's no good. It's no good. You understand? Um, because of one's not 
being willing because of his unwillingness to be guided by the love faculty. In other words, because he was unwilling, and, and he's now a type, but he also shows us a type of the, the human condition. You understand? A type of nature. You understand? Of coldness, unproductiveness, of life and good. Why? Why is that there that coldness? Why is there that unproductiveness of life and good? Because he and his kind was unwilling and not willing to be guided by the love faculty, by Jah's love, the faculty of Jah's love. So Korah was descended from Levi, Lewi. And Lewi, the name Levi, biblically, scripturally, it signifies the love faculty, the faculty of love in each of our individual consciousness. So if we want to now identify these, these biblical, scriptural, in other words, um, 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 elements within the, the true spirituality, we will have to be able to interpret accurately the names and what they apply to. So within us, in our individual consciousness, Levi signifies the love faculty, the faculty of love by, by way of or through the law of God through the law of Jah. Now, it says right here, see Aser, see Aser, son of, of Korah. Now, remember I mentioned about the earth opening up, right? The earth opening up and swallowing up. And I said that that was similar to what, what the duat of ancient Egypt was, the so-called underworld, the amento, the underworld. So they went into, in that sense, the underworld. But now here in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, it says to see this name, Asir. Now, it's interesting, this name Asir, because, you know, you see this name Asir, and you might say, well, is that Osar, right? Um, like Osiris, in that sense. Um, Asir, Osar, so forth, and so on, or the, quote, Osiris. Now, Osiris also, he descended into an underworld as well, according to ancient Egyptian um Ideas now. Let's keep in mind Jude chapter, Jude verse eleven. Let's just go to Jude verse eleven again. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, Cain, the way of Cain. Now under Cain it says this. Cain. This is show how all of these types are connected, and the name now gives us the the key. The name is the key, and the understanding of the name. Like it says in the Revelation, it says, here's wisdom, right, concerning the name, being to calculate or computate or even number, as it were, the name. So Cain of Genesis chapter uh, 4 and verse 1, he is a, he is a type of, of religious, natural, religious, natural man, uh, a man who is a natural man who is religious, who believes in a God. He, it's not like he, he's an atheist. Cain, the Cain type, is a religious, natural man who believes in a God and in religion. They believe in religion. You go to church on Sunday, do this, on that. Do that. But it's after his own will. These are the types who will tell you, well, you know, the Sabbath, you know, any, any day I want to make my Sabbath is my Sabbath. It don't have to be Saturday. It could be any other day. And they'll say, yes. I and I, Rastafari, or I and I is Christian, or I and I is religious, but I, I'll do this, you know, I believe in God, and the, the God this, God that, so forth and so on, but it's after their own will. So where, where did we hear that before? Do what thou wilt. You understand? Do what thou wilt. The law of Salema. So Cain could be a member of um, the OTO. Do what thou wilt. He's religious. He believes in the God, not the true God, but he believes in the God. And furthermore, it says that um, he rejects redemption by blood. And this is very, very interesting. He rejects that there can be any redemption by way of blood, namely by way of the blood of the black Moshiach, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos. Now, compelled as a teacher of religion. Now, when this type is compelled 
as a teacher, you know, was when they're in the church and now they have to teach on, um, you know, explain, explain the atonement, for example. This sort of apostate teacher, one who is a teacher but denies the true teaching of his majesty and his Christ, you understand? This true teacher explains it away. He ex- and, and you hear this a lot in this modern, um, this modern Babylonianism kind of ecumenicalism kind of religion. You hear a lot of these people who are religious teachers and things that the Bible says no, they now are explaining away yes. And when you ask them about the atonement, they explain that away too. So that's kind of what gives them authority. But they're doing all of this by their own will. You know what I'm saying? Now, let's remember what, what Korah, the name Korah, is defined as, because um, this is the first one right here, Cain. So the Cain type needs to be understood. Secondarily, we have the era of Balaam, the era of Balaam. So let's uh, put this up here for a moment. From Jude 11, we have the Cain type. Remember, the way of Cain, right? The way of Cain. Then we have... Um, we have um, the era of Balaam, right? right? We have the era of Balaam. And then we have the gainsaying of Korah, or Korah, the way it's spelled in the, in the, um, in the King James um, New Testament, Jude chapter 11. You see this? Remember the Bible talks about there's a false trinity? There's a true trinity, the triune God. You understand? But there's also a false trinity that, that comes from the false prophets out of the mouth. You know, it says that's frogs. But, you know, that, that is, it's interesting, too, because how frogs also, in a sense, come out of the earth. You know, they jump, they hop out, right? So we have Cain, right? The way of Cain, the era of Balaam, and the gainsaying of Korah. So Cain, now, the way of Cain is self-will. Not Jah's will, but their own will. You know what I'm saying? Remember, the type on the surface is religious. You know, like it says right here, it's a religious type that believes in God. You say, do you believe in the God? Well, yeah, the Cain type believes in God. The Cain type can say they believe in God, too. The Cain type can even say they believe in one God. They can say that. You understand? Know but after their own will, after their own volition, you know what I'm saying? They reject redemption by the blood of Yeshua. You understand? compelled when they're, when, when they're in a position of authority or as a teacher of religion, they explain the atonement by explaining it away. And it was making it of none effect. And, and the Bible talks about those who make the blood of Yeshua of none effect. All right? Now, Balaam now is the era of Balaam. We haven't come up to Balaam just yet in, in chapter 22 and 5 of um Numbers do we touch on Balaam, but let's just get a kind of a head start right here. What is the error? Remember the key word, the way, quote, of Cain, self-will. Now, what is the error of Balaam? The error of Balaam must be distinguished from his way. This is a very key thing that the Schofield um, Bible people put here as their, as their study notes. Second Peter Chapter 2, verse 15, there's a note there. If you have the Schofield, go check it out. If you want to check it out in the Schofield, go to our website and download it from the, from the study page. And his doctrine. So Balaam, he has an error, but he has a way, and he has his own teaching. So, so the, the Balaamites, they have their own teaching. Revelation, um, chapter 2, verse 14, there's a note there as well. Now, the era of Balaam was that, reasoning from natural morality. He reasoned from natural morality, right? And seeing the evil, he saw evil in Israel. He saw evil in Ayana. He saw evil in black people. He supposed a righteous God must curse them. He supposed that, well, if, if this is his people, they're doing all this, a righteous God must curse this sort of a people. But he was blind. He was a blind God. Now, this is interesting. He was blind. Balaam was blind, right? Blind in one eye, and like the, like the eye on the back of the dollar, one eye. Their God having one eye, 
you, see, uh, you begin to see this picture here. So he was blind. What was he blind to? He was blind to the higher morality of the cross. He was blinded to the higher morality of the mescal, of the cross, through which Jah, or God, maintains and enforces the authority and awful, the awful sanctions. You know, they talk about a sanction. They, they have sanction on Iran or whatever. But the true, the true God, the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, through the cross, he maintains and enforces the authority and the awful sanctions of his law, of his law, so that he can be just so that he can be tzaddik, as well as a justifier of the mitmanan, who might be a chatiatenyo, who might have committed sin, of the so-called believing sinner. Now, the reward that is mentioned of verse 11 may not be money. It does not have to be money, but we made an application of it in this present time. But it can be popularity. It can be applause. So we need to understand that the reward now that Balaam runs after is not always money. Money is one object, but the next object could be popularity, to be popular. You understand? To be an American idol or, or star or everybody says nice things or applause to get the crowd to clap for them. Right? So let's, let's understand that. So money, popularity, applause. Remember, Cain has a way. Right? Cain has a way. That way is self-will. Right? He denies the blood, explains the way atonement, believes in God, and is very religious or is a religious sort of person after their own way of interpretation, after their own way. Not after Yahweh, not after Yahweh, but after their own way. Do what thou wilt shall be all the law. Blah, 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 blah. Right? Balaam now, Balaam has an error. His error is that a righteous God must must curse his people, you understand, who are not living righteously. But he, he's blind to the cross. He does not overstand the mescal. He doesn't overstand by extension a la libella. He doesn't overstand the cross. You know what I'm saying? He doesn't understand what that's all about. Right? Now he and his reward is either money popularity, applause, one or all of them, or a combination of any one of them. Lastly, but not leastly, we touched on Korah. You know what I'm saying? We touched on Korah. Korah's sin was the denial of the authority of Moses as God's chosen spokesman. In other words, why him, why not me? Sort of be attitude. And was an intrusion into the priestly or the priestical office the intrusion, and in a sense, he did not keep his estate because he was, a, he was a descendant of Kohath. They had a part to play in the tabernacle, but instead he wanted to play Moses and him and uh, Ab Abiram, Datan and Abiram, they basically got played. Now, we're going to go to Asir. We, we, we then leave off on Asir and the Osiris connection right here. We're going to go to Asir, right, who was a son of Korah. But before we go there, let's deal with Korah, the son of Asa. Now, Korah, the son of Asa, is Korah a Hebrew? Well, of course he must be, because Abraham was a Hebrew. Therefore, his descendants are Hebrew. Therefore, from Abraham comes Asa or comes Esau. You understand? So Esau is a Hebrew as well. But is he a righteous Hebrew? Well, that's obvious that he is not. So Korah, the son of Asa, he denotes the coldness, the crystallization or ice becoming like ice, the barrenness or the baldness, like when the land is barren, you understand, or is unfruitful in that sense, unproductive, um, the baldness of consciousness. So this, this, this barrenness is barrenness of consciousness. There's nothing, that, there's nothing fruitful. There's no fruit there. There's no greenness there. There's no freshness there. It, it, it's like a wilderness. It's like a bottom. It's like bottom with the Ethiopian and Eritrean are fighting over a bottom, a wasteland, right? It, it's that sort of 
idea, but on the conscious level, that results, that result from dominance of the mind of the flesh. You see, all of this is stemming from the mind of the flesh. So this is teaching us about the mind of the flesh right here, Korah and his co-conspirators, his, his, his co-rebels, they were in the mind of the flesh, which is the Esau, the Esau man. The Hebrews, you understand, but not righteous Hebrews, in the individual. The Esau man in the individual is the mind of flesh in the individual. Now, they have Korahites, who are Korahites here, who are the, are, are the, the offspring of Korah. They are the Levites descended from Korah, the great-grandson of Levi in Exodus 6 and 24. Metaphysically, they are thoughts springing from and belonging to that in consciousness which Korah, the great-grandson of Levi, signifies. They say, see Korah, clear crystal definitions of Korah bespeak a comprehension that would aid in raising these Korah thoughts to the love and productiveness that belong to their true nature. So it's through my nature, but we're speaking about true nature versus false nature. So the descendants of this consciousness can rise to a higher, a higher level than their infamous ancestor. That reminds me of, of John's law where he says about like... Um, how he shows um, 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 mercy to thousand generation, but then he, he, he keeps that, that judgment on those who continue in the wrong way. But even if one of the descendants of the ancient evildoers should repudiate, you understand, the evil and do John's will, you understand, they too will gain a name in John's house that is greater than that of sons or daughters. And um, to one of I and I study partners and brother, brethren, Wendy Manley, it, it kind of touches a little bit on what you had text I and I concerning the Gentiles, which is a correct point, but the Gentiles, and we still have to deal with the Gentiles, but what's very interesting, we're dealing with Hebrews, you understand, who are more in the Esau consciousness, you understand, or the fleshy Hebrew mind, and are not in the spiritual Hebrew mind, you understand, or, the, or they're not in the mind of the spirit. So on the New Testament level of understanding this particular Torah portion in Christ, what we're learning about right here is an example now of the mind of flesh. So when we're in the New Testament, when we're reading Hawaii up Aulos, uh, Paul's um, various epistles, and he's speaking about the whole a mind of flesh and versus the mind of spirit, how one lusteth against the other and they struggle against the two. This is that spiritual warfare. You understand that each of us, you understand, as we come to spiritual consciousness, have to make a choice. You see, and some folks don't really either make the choice or they make it sluggishly, and this is where you get caught on duality. You get caught in double-mindedness. You have to really be careful very careful of that, because if you try to stay on the fence, you are going to be split like an hypocrite. But before we go to Aser, let's just deal with the Koru for K, since we're right here. That's the next um, entry here. We already said that Kore, uh, Kore, Kore. Uh, we have Kura, the caller, a crier, proclaimer, beseecher, convoker, um, reciter, a partridge, like a partridge, a little bird, a quail, any calling bird. Any bird that calls can be called a kore in that sense. And we already touched on the Ethiopic link with this, or the kura, the, the, the raven. The raven in the Amharic and the Ethiopic also has a very similar name to this. Now, um, kore, or kore, he was a Levite, a descendant of kore. You understand First uh, uh, Chronicles, First Chronicles 9 and 19? He was a Levite, a son of Imna, 2 Chronicles 31 and 14. Now, metaphysically, what about the metaphysical of this? That in man's natural religious tendency, that which, this name means that which in man's natural 
religious tendencies. Remember, we're touching a lot on religious here. A lot, there, there, there's a lot of religious subtext to this particular area right here, and it's interesting because this is dealing for rebellion against God's chosen, you know what I'm saying, against God's chosen man. I kind of liken this in Rastafari in a sense to us putting more emphasis on Marcus Garvey than on Dr. Malako Emanuel Bayan of the EWF, Ethiopian World Federation, um, fame or history or, or legacy of our divine heritage. But that's another, that's another um, point, but it's still in, in, in principle what we're saying, that John sends this one, but instead you go after that one. You know what I'm saying? John sends him, but you go after him over there. Why? Because in man's natural religious tendency, the Levites, in their office of ministering in the house of Jehovah, the house of Yahweh, their role and responsibility was, their office was the office of minister, of steward, of administrator of the house of Jah. You know what I'm saying? Or the true churchical, we could say, foundation, which insistently suggests and proclaims true ideas to man's inner consciousness and seeks to impress them on him. Now, it's interesting that in this, this, this K Korah, who is, who is in some way a descendant, he's a latter descendant of this Korah, that we actually see what the, Kor the, the Korahites um, entry said, that these thoughts, right, these thoughts bespeak a comprehension. That means if there's the ability to comprehend this and to learn from this lesson, this now aids I and I individually and in unity collectively in raising these, these, these Korah thoughts, these lower thoughts, the baldness, the ice, the hail, the frost, the unproductiveness, the coldness, um, um, not being willing to be guided by Jah's love faculty, which is, which is Lewi or Levi, you know what I'm saying? Now to those natural religious tendencies, which insistently, which continually suggest and reminds and proclaims the truth, the true ideas to man's inner, to his inner consciousness and seeks to impress them, to impress them on him. Now, the men named Kore or Kore, they belonged to the porters in the temple in latter temple times. So we're talking about what occurs in the wilderness here, but we're looking at the latter descendants and a more positive outcome with the latter descendant, even though their ancestor, in that sense, had a bad name. They did better because these were the porters in the temple. One of them, quote, was over the free will offerings. There was one particular um, man that was named Kore in the latter in the latter times of the Beta Israel, in the temple times of the Beta Israel, that was over the free will offerings of Ha Elohim, Baruchu, of the true God, to distribute the oblations of Yahweh, to distribute them, and the most holy things. So we do see one, one of the latter descendants, and this is, this is very interesting with everything that we've been seeking to teach on and communicate, even from the previous last, last week's portion. And if you haven't checked out, like, the Shashimani, Shashimani Now part or series, please check it out, because it's very important to really see, okay, now we have... We have those who rebel and from 20 years old and up who died in the wilderness. And then now in this portion, we have another rebel. But then by looking at the, studying the name, we can see from low degrees, Korach, a rebel who was swallowed up by the earth, to a higher degree of a porter. Now, here's what's so very interesting. Korach, or Korach, he wanted him and his crew wanted to intrude and be, be what Moses was chosen to be. They wanted to intrude into the priestical office and be the chosen, the chosen representative, the captain on, 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 you know, on top. They wanted to be the executive. They wanted to be so-called the international president, so to speak, right? But that wasn't John's will. You know, that wasn't what John's will was. And then we get a descendant 
with a similar and same name, Kore, really Korach, contracted would be Kore, um, linguistically, etymologically speaking, in the Afro-Shemitic, but we get a descendant later on, Kore or Kore, who is just a porter. This one is a porter. They, they were porters, right, almost like doorkeepers and, and attendants in the temple, right, in the temple. I think at this particular point, this must have been the temple of uh, Solomon, in Solomon, Solomon's temple. And one of them was over the free will offerings of God. They distributed the oblations of Yahweh, of Jehovah, and the most holy things. They had a high role. It almost reminds me of what David says, I prefer to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to sup at sumptuous tables with the wicked and the weak-hearted. I prefer this to be a doorkeeper in John's house, opening and closing those doors. And those are the keys, basically, of David. Now, let's go to Asir. Asir, because once we understand the name well enough, and I think that if ones are paying attention or go over this particular research and some of the reference materials that we have pointed out, and I'm sure there's other reference materials out there, well, we're overstanding this clear idea. So in, we're getting another microcosm, you understand, of the macrocosm, where we have an ancestor who is a rebel, but the children or the great, 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 great grandchildren later learning and rising to a higher consciousness. In other words, learning not to do what they will, but learning to do Jah's will. And this is, this is contained in the teaching of Kedamawi Haile Selassie, of Haile Selassie first, where he says to make our wills obedient to good influence.